The mine map shows the four mine portals, which are drift entries into the coal seam. There are three active working sections of the mine. All three sections are utilizing a continuous miner and two shuttle cars. Coal is transported to the surface by a conveyor belt, and transportation to the sections is by track and battery-powered equipment. The mine liberates 600,000 cubic feet of methane in 24 hours, and mine ventilation is provided by a blowing fan in the number four portal entry. The mine produces coal on the day and evening shift, and the night shift is a maintenance shift. Federal law requires that for each shift that miners work underground, there shall be a responsible person in attendance designated by the mine operator to take charge during a mine emergency involving a fire, explosion, or gas or water inundation. At this mine, the designated responsible person is the control room operator, who has responsibility for monitoring the carbon monoxide monitoring system installed in the conveyor belt entries. The control room operator observes the monitor and determines that the alarm is on the number five belt line, sensor number 21. He immediately phones the belt foreman underground, who is at the number four belt drive, and asks him to check out the alarm. Hello, Bill Jackson. Hello, Bill Jackson, call the control room. Hey, Bill, I got a problem here. Apparently on number five belt, the number 21 sensor just went off. I need to see if you can get up there, see what you can find out and call me back. Okay, all right. Hello, Bill Jackson. Go ahead, it's Bill Jackson. Bill, I just had number 20, number 22 go off too. Let me know as soon as you can and find out something, buddy. The control room operator realizes that he may have a serious problem because of the continued alarm sounding. So he begins to keep a written log of everything that he's seeing and hearing. He also calls Tom Smith, supply house man, who is the only other person on the surface this evening to come to the control room Here, to help. I need you to go down this list, call these people in order, okay? Jot down the time you called and whether or not they answered or if you left a message, okay? MSHA requires that notification be provided within 15 minutes if any of the 12 following conditions occur at a mine. Since 15 minutes is a very short time in trying to find out what's happening when an event occurs at a mine, it is best to call the MSHA emergency hotline number and report that you think that any of the 12 items is a possibility. The death of an individual at a mine. An injury to an individual at a mine which has a reasonable potential to cause death. An entrapment of an individual for more than 30 minutes or which has a reasonable potential to cause death an unplanned inundation of a mine by a liquid or gas, an unplanned ignition or explosion of gas or dust. In underground mines, an unplanned fire not extinguished within 10 minutes of discovery. In surface mines and surface areas of underground mines, an unplanned fire not extinguished within 30 minutes of discovery, an unplanned ignition or explosion of a blasting agent or an explosive, an unplanned roof fall, at or above the anchorage zone and active workings where roof bolts are in use, or an unplanned roof or rib fall in active workings that impairs ventilation or impedes passage, a cold or rock outburst that causes withdrawal of miners or which disrupts regular mining activity for more than one hour, an unstable condition at an impoundment, refuge pile, or calm bank which requires emergency action in order to prevent failure, or which causes individuals to evacuate an area, or failure of an impoundment, refuge pile, or calm bank. Damage to hoisting equipment in a shaft or slope, which endangers an individual, or which interferes with the use of the equipment for more than 30 minutes. And an event at a mine which causes death or bodily injury to an individual not at the mine at the time the event occurs. Tom Smith uses the emergency manual contact page to contact the necessary people. On that list is the MSHA emergency hotline number that must be called within 15 minutes of a mine emergency. Regardless of how much information you have at the first sign of a potential mine emergency, call the hotline number within 15 minutes and report what you know to the operator. Have information ready, such as mine name, company name, a phone number at which you can be reached, and the MSHA mine ID number. Also report what's going on and what you know to be factual. A local MSHA representative will call you back shortly to get more information. So be ready for that call and keep notes on everything that's going on. Hello, 
My name is Tom Smith, and I'm with the Belleville Coal Company, number one mine. Our ID number is 00-36548. We have an emergency and several CO sensors on the belt lines are going off. This is all we know at this time. Our callback number is 205-649-2660. Thank you. Tom will also call the state hotline number if this is appropriate. Yeah. Hey, you have a phone call. I think it's work. Hello? Yeah? Which mines? Okay, I'll give them a call right now. Hello, CO room. Hello, CO room. This control room, go ahead. I'm at the number five belt drive. Just two cross cuts in by. I found heavy smoke and the cell alarm on my detector went off. I have 200 parts per million CO. There appears to be damage on the belt line. I can see flames uh, about half across that end by me. I see blocks from the stoppings laying in the belt entry. Send me my two belt men up here to help me out. I'm hooking up the water line, see if I can put the fire out. I'll wait here for further instructions. Also, how about activating the emergency evacuation signal on the tracking system? Notify everyone need to get out. We also need to make sure that we contact the two fire bosses and the three belt men on number two belt conveyor. I tried calling number three section, but I couldn't get an answer. All right, I'll take care of it. Thank you. The control room operator makes notes in the logbook, activates the evacuation signal on the minor tracking system that each miner carries, and begins calling the working sections on the pager phone. Hello, John James. Call the control room. John, this control room. Bill needs you and Buddy to come up to the number five belt drive. We got a fire situation up there. He needs your help. The control room operator calls the belt men to help with the fire and then begins calling the numbers one, two, and three sections to order an evacuation. Hello, number one section, two section, and three section. Call the control room. The numbers one and two sections respond that they are on their way out. Listen, I got a problem developing. I'm going to need to evacuate the mine. We need to get your people out. Well, this number two, right? All right, number two, I need you to gather your people. Start coming out. We're calling to evacuate the mine. I need you, if you see anyone along the track, to pick them up. The two fire bosses call in from the returns and report that they are on their way out. The three belt men shoveling the number two belt call in on their handheld radios, and they are also on their way out of the mine. He can get no response from the number three section. Tom, I'm not getting any response from number three section. I'm not getting any answers to tracking system. I'm not getting any response signals. The whole thing must be out. Let's keep those phone calls going. Hello, Bill Jackson. Okay, CO. Bill, I have number one and two sections on their way out. I still can't get an answer on number three section. Keep an eye out for them. If you see them in the intake escape way, let me know if, you, if they pass you. Okay. Uh, you two men are on the way. How are you doing with the fire? All right. Uh, Mike, things are about the same here. We're spraying water, but we can't see much. We're working in clean air, and we do not have any CO where we're at now. I go to the intake every once in a while and take a phone with me. I'll call you when I hear anything. All right, buddy. Okay. Uh, Mike Jones, control room operator, Bevel State Coal Company, number one mine. This is David Dawson. Yeah, assistant district manager with MSHA. I hear you have an emergency at the mines. Can you uh, tell me what's going on? Mike begins to relate everything he's noted on his log and what is going on at that time. He is very specific to tell that he has two section crews on their way out, but has been unable to contact the number three section crew. He also relates that Bill Jackson, belt foreman, and two miners are stationed near the number five belt drive and are fighting the fire. Bill is also monitoring the situation from there. Mike, I'm issuing a 103J order, which means that in the event of any accident occurring in a coal or other mines where rescue and recovery work is necessary, the secretary or an authorized representative of the secretary should take whatever action he deems appropriate to protect the life of any person, and he may, if he deems appropriate, 
supervise and direct the rescue and recovery activities in such mines. I will have some of the infra get to the mines as soon as I can. It may take about an hour before we get there. Let me remind you that the order also requires you to preserve all evidence that will assist in the investigation. Yes, sir. MSHA has just issued a 103J order. A 103J order means that MSHA is taking control of the mine to preserve evidence and to protect workers. MSHA does have the right under a 103J to allow work to continue underground to assist with rescue and recovery and to protect the mine. It is Mike's responsibility to make sure that Mr. Dawson understands the situation and that he approves that firefighting and underground evaluation activities continue. Without this specific approval, no work can be done underground while the J order is in effect. Yes, sir, Mr. Dawson. We're uh, continuing to fight the fire. We'd like permission to continue to do so. Uh, we feel like if we leave it right now, it could spread across the entries and it might trap anyone that would be in by. Uh, we also want to continue monitoring the conditions on the number five belt and the intake escapeway uh, in the hopes that some of the crew will evacuate and we'll be able to provide them with transportation. Yes, sir. Additional information will almost always be required. The MSHA person must ask questions to try to obtain information that makes him comfortable that the situation is being handled correctly and that you are truly in charge of the event. Examples of questions which may be asked are as follows. What air and gas readings are available? What are the air qualities where the fire is being fought? What are the gas readings where the fire is being fought? What are the gas readings at the fan? How many people are unaccounted for and what is their location? What is the tracking system showing concerning the missing miners? What other pertinent information is relevant to the event? Several other questions may be asked, and you may or may not know all the answers as you are just minutes into the event. Answer all questions that you can factually. You must convince MSHA that you are taking actions that are safe and feasible. MSHA has the option to either allow or not to allow continuing work when the 103J order is issued. If you do not have enough information, or the information you provide indicates that safety may be a concern, MSHA may elect to institute the 103J order and require the withdrawal of everyone from the mine. Okay, Mike, you can continue monitoring and firefighting. Call me back if you have any changes, and MSHA's people will be there soon. Mike has related the appropriate and correct information to the MSHA representative on the phone and has gotten permission to continue with underground activities. This is very important and has been handled in the right manner. If Mike had not received permission over the phone to continue with underground activities, he would have had to withdraw everyone and stop all work because of the issuance of the 103J order. Then before anyone could re-enter the mine, MSHA would have to arrive on site and evaluate the situation, which could take several hours. MSHA managers do have written instructions to allow underground activities to continue, if necessary, when they issue the 103J order. Hello, Bill Jackson. Hello, Bill Jackson. Call the CO. Yeah, Bill, this is uh, CO room. MSHA has given us permission to continue to fight the fire and to monitor the situation down there. If anything changes, call me immediately. All right, thank you. Kyle Boston, mine superintendent, and Fred Jenkins, mine clerk, arrive in the control room. They are briefed by Mike Jones and shown what is happening on the mine map. Uh, at 8.15, I got an alarm here on the number 21 CO sensor. I uh, got a hold of Bill Jackson, belt supervisor, but during that time also 20 and 22 went off. I asked him to go check out, see if I had a problem. He went down, he reported smoke and saw some flames. So I activated the emergency response system, started calling section one, two, and three. Got answers from one and two. Never got an answer from number three. We activated the tagger system to let people know. I uh, had Tom come in from Supply House and we called the regular list of phone numbers. As it stands right now, everyone is out, except for number three section, number one section, number two section are out. The two fire bosses, the pumpers are out. The only people left in the mine, except for number three section, are Bill Jackson and his two helpers who are fighting the fire. IMSA gave us permission to continue fighting the fire at this point and also monitor the fire itself and the intake escapeway in case other people came out. Okay, Mike, you've done a good job.
Uh, we're going to set up a command center. Uh, if you would, go back to the uh, mine-wide monitoring system and uh, please notify us of any, any changes that take place or any emergencies that develop. Yes, sir. Fred, get a copy of our mine emergency plan. Follow the notification procedures that are outlined in that plan. Uh, make sure that the police restrict access coming in here. MSHA and the state are soon going to be coming here and uh, on their arrival, make sure they get uh, access to come through the command center, that the police don't stop them from coming on the property. Uh, if you would set up a location for the family members and the media, we're gonna have to do a briefing session pretty soon, you know, for the media, if we need to get a set of facts together to do that briefing. Uh, I want you to, uh, there's a labor representative that was underground uh, when he gets to the surface, if you wouldn't mind, get him uh, to come to the command center. We need to brief him on what's how it's taking place. And uh, we need to contact our mine rescue teams and get them started this way. It looks like we're going to be here for a little while. Kyle Boston is taking charge of the situation. He's making sure that everyone necessary is being notified and that appropriate actions according to the mine emergency plan are being done. As others are notified, according to the plan, they will take their appropriate assignments from the plan and be ready to perform all pre-assigned duties. The room selected for the command center needs to be large enough to accommodate the parties to be represented. It is important to have an appropriate number of persons in the command center. Too many and the room will be overcrowded and difficult to manage. Expect several representatives from mine management and reps from MSHA, state and labor. Phones need to be installed both landlines and pager phones. Computers should be available. Maps need to be positioned for ease of observance and capabilities of making map copies will be needed. Room needs to be provided for scribes who will be taking notes and maintaining a log of all activities from all parties involved. 